In order for somebody who's mistreated you to be happy, they have to come to a place of repentance. They have to deal with that with God. So when somebody's hurt you and you pray for them to be happy, what you're asking God to do is reveal to the truth to them about the way they are so they can repent. Listen, I lived a life where I was full of hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness. And I was miserable. There was no way I could be happy. I don't care what I owned, I could not be happy until I got that poison out of me. Amen? And when you forgive somebody, you are, you're helping yourself a whole lot more than you're helping them. Father, I thank you for the word tonight. And this is very important to me and I believe it's very important to you. And I talk about love a lot, but we don't know anything until we're doing it. It doesn't matter how many times we've heard it or how many times we've got it underlined in our Bible. Until we're doing it, we need to hear it again. And the world is full of just mean people today. And I think they're that way because they're hurting. And what they really need is love, and there's nobody to show it to them except the believers, because you work through us. So I pray that tonight that people who have heard it and heard it but never really got it, I pray tonight they'll get it. That it'll not just be information, but will become revelation. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well. Matthew 24 is a chapter in the Bible that talks about signs of the end times. And I know every generation always thinks Jesus is coming back in their generation, and I don't know exactly when He's coming back, but I do know I want to be ready. Amen? And more of the end time signs that Jesus talked about, more of the end time prophecies have been fulfilled than at any other time in history. So Jesus could come back tonight, could be another hundred years, I don't know. But one of the signs of the last days, in Matthew 24 it says, and then many will be offended. Boy, people are touchy today. Man. And this is just not unbelievers. I'm talking church people. They will betray one another and will hate one another. Hate is such a nasty word. I was sitting in the doctor's office the other day getting a vitamin drip, trying to get all the strength I could for this weekend, and there were several people back there getting different treatments, and somebody brought up a politician's name, and another lady said, I hate him. And just even when she said that, it's just the whole feeling that filled the room was just like, Ugh. Many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. We have to be so careful today about deception. You, just because you read something online doesn't mean it's true. Amen? And if you read something unkind about somebody else, the first thing that should come out of your mouth is, I don't believe it just because you said it. The Bible says that every accusation should be proven in the mouth of two or three faithful witnesses, <laughs> people that actually really know what they're talking about. When you hear gossip, Chris won't mind me sharing this three or four years ago. Somebody called me up and told me something not good about her. And you know what I said? I don't believe that. 
I said, I just do not believe that. I know her and I don't believe it. But I said, I'll tell you what I am going to do. When I hang this phone up, I'm going to call her and ask her. You remember? I called you and you said, that's not true. I called the girl back and I said, it's not true. And whoever told you, you need to call them and tell them it's not true. Do you know how quick you can ruin somebody's reputation? Just by passing stuff on that you've heard. I just, people who talk about other people, they don't know anything about them. It's just ridiculous. I read online the other day, I don't, I don't know why I did this, but I decided I'd look me up. <laughs> I, I normally don't do anything like that, but I, I, I'll just say what they're, see what they're saying about me today. So I looked it up and the first thing I read is all of her clothes come from Gucci. I don't even have a pair of Gucci sunglasses. I don't have one thing. People just make stuff up. Just anything to try to make you look like you're stealing people's money. Or the devil doesn't want people believing, and so he tries to give a bad reputation to people that are trying to spread the gospel, and you just Thank you. Even if I had some Gucci clothes, you'd still love me, right? But I don't. Actually, I bought most of my clothes for 30 some odd years at the same little boutique here in St. Louis. And the girl that I bought them from was here last night. And they're not Gucci, but so people just lie. They just lie about you. One time they wrote about me in the paper that I had a $25,000 toilet. Who in the world would have a $25,000 toilet? I don't even think you can buy a $25,000 toilet. I mean, just stupid stuff. So don't believe everything you hear. And whatever you do, don't spread it to somebody else. Because here's what happens. When you tell somebody something, even if they don't want to believe it, they've still got it in them and they got to try to get rid of it. And it makes them just a little bit more suspicious of that person than they would have been. One of the things we need to commit to tonight, if we're going to walk in love, is to say good things about each other. And let me just tell you what your mama told you. If you can't say something good, don't say anything at all. Amen? Let's protect each other. Can we do that? We're family. Let's protect each other. And because of the lawlessness that will abound in the land, the love of many will grow cold. Another translation says the love of the great body will grow cold, and that means the church. So what's happening? Because of all the trouble in the world, people are focusing on that. And, the, you know, the more you focus on trouble, the meaner, the sourer you're going to get. We need to let the devil just do himself in, and we need to focus on God and helping people and being a blessing to other people and walking in love. Sometimes we need a little help. I had love tattooed on my ankle. That way reminds me every time I see my foot to walk in love. I need a little help. I need to be reminded sometimes, amen? I got another one too, right back here. The guy said, I, Dave and I were the oldest people he'd ever tattooed. <laughs> and this one says, I belong to Jesus. <laughs> See that devil? I'm owned and bought with the blood. And of course, Dave got an American flag. <laughs> now, I know some of you think getting the tattoo is demonic. Well, 
In the Bible, in Isaiah, it says there were people who had tattooed on their hands, I belong to the Lord. In Isaiah, it says that God has a picture of us tattooed on the palms of his hands. So before you get an opinion, why don't you read the whole book? Amen. So now all of you that have been wanting to get one, but you wondered if it was right or not, well, there you go. God commands us to love everyone. Luke 6, 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners can love those who love them back. <laughs> so loving people that love you, that doesn't really tell you anything about yourself. If you really want to find out the kind of love God's talking about, you got to love people that are mean to you. People that aren't so good to you. You say, well, that, that's just really hard to do. Well, the first thing you need to do is stop saying it's hard. That's one of our biggest excuses. Well, it's just hard. It's hard. It's hard. In Deuteronomy 30, it says, nothing God has told us to do is too hard. So we need to start saying, I can do whatever God has told me to do. Not it's too hard. In the Bible, we see the word love a lot, but there's four Greek words that are all translated love, which is kind of a shame because then we just lump it all together and we love the cat next door and we love ice cream and we love our kids and we love our house and we love our car and all of that kind of love that we're talking about is connected to a warm fuzzy feeling. And see, when somebody mistreats you, you're not going to have warm fuzzy feelings. You're going to want to knock them across the room. But you know what? I, one of the things I've found out in my 45 years of studying the Bible you can feel like doing the wrong thing and still choose to do the right thing. Come on, did you hear me? Walking in the flesh is walking according to your feelings or according to your own carnal mind. So I'm going to say it again. You can feel like doing the wrong thing and still choose to do the right thing. And after all, it is about choice. <clears throat> God has given us a free will. You know what a chance he was taking when he gave us free will? <laughs> Man. Every choice that we make has some kind of a, an effect. And I'm just going to go ahead and say this earlier. We have way too many disobedient Christians. Thank you. I guess I'll say it till I can get a better clap than that. We have way too many disobedient Christians. Well, everybody does it these days. Well, you're not everybody. And if you're the only person that you know that does it right, if you love God, Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey me. He did not say, if you obey me, I will love you. He's already made up his mind to love us. But one of the ways that we show our love for God is by being obedient to him. And I have found out that when you do the right thing while it's still hurting you, that's when you're growing. When it's easy to do the right thing, then you've already grown. You've already gone through the hard parts, and now that has become part of you. And the longer you walk with God, there will be more of that and more in that of more of that. So we just keep growing in our walk with God. It's called spiritual maturity. <laughs> Amen? Amen? And as far as I'm concerned, after you're born again, that's the most important thing to do is start growing spiritually. God sent the Holy Spirit to live inside of us, and He's our teacher. He quickly convicts us of wrongdoing and convinces us to do things right. Last night when we went out to the car after the meeting, 
Dave is very protective of me and always has been. And I'm not always a real careful person. And a lot of times I got my mind on the next thing I'm going to do instead of the thing I'm doing. And so we were getting into the van and part of the seat was brought forward for people to get in the back and I'm getting in my little space here and he's trying to tell me to be careful. Be careful, don't, you don't want to get that slammed on your hand. Well, I'm in a hurry and I'm wanting to get going and I'm, I'm like, I've gotten in a car a million times. I can do this. Well, I knew like that, that it just wasn't the right way, the right attitude to have. And so, first thing I did this morning, couldn't hardly wait for him to wake up so I could go and apologize to him. Don't, don't just know that you've done something wrong, even if it's little. If you can go make it right, go make it right. It's time for us to have some humility. Come on. And so I just told him, I said, I'm sorry that I didn't have a good attitude last night. I know you were just trying to help me. And he's always so forgiving. He just, I mean, he, man, you talk about somebody that's forgiven somebody for the same thing over and over and over. It's him. Patience is one of the first fruits of love, and I'm still working on it. But there's four words, Greek words, trans, translated love. There's eros, which is a romantic love. It's the love you feel for this good-looking man that you've met. And you're just like, ooh, every time you see him, your heart beats hard. I love you, I love you. Well, I want to tell you, you better get married on something other than that. Because the way I love Dave now is so much deeper. My God, I didn't even know what love was when I married him. You don't know what love is until you go through some things with people and you put up with some stuff and you forgive them over and over and over and you learn how the two can become one. There's storage, S-T-O-R-G-E, and that's family love. That's the kind of love you have for your kids or your mom and dad, that kind of love. Phileo is brotherly love, the, fe the love that we all feel for one another. And all those are good, but the love that we're after is agape. And that's divine love. The kind of love that God has for us. Now, right away we think that's impossible, but it's really not because the Bible says that the love of God is poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit when we're born again. So anything we have in us, we can give away. <laughs> if you have it in you and somebody needs it, you can give it. So God would not require us to love people with that divine kind of love, which means they didn't do anything to deserve it. God is not just doing love, He is love. That's why while we were still yet in our sin, He died for us. That's why on the cross, having had nails driven into His hands and feet and been beaten, he could say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That's love. When we can stop looking at what people are doing to us and understand what they're doing to themselves by what they're doing to us. You understand me? I'm going to say it again. We need to be more concerned about when you mistreat me, it's I, get, I can get through that. I've got the healer living on the inside of me, but you've hurt yourself. And I need to pray for you because now you've, you're messing up your life by not treating me right.
Three of the four kinds of love involve emotion, but God's divine love does not. It may be there, but it may not. And God is requiring us to treat people the same way, whether we have that fuzzy feeling or whether we don't. Now, I know right away some of you are thinking, well, surely you're not just telling us that God wants us to be a doormat and let people walk all over us and mistreat us and abuse us and blah, blah, blah. Well, no, and depending on how far I get, which is usually not as far as I'd like to, I will tell you that some people you have to love from a distance. I had to love my father from a distance for a long time because he was a sexual abuser and it wasn't wise or safe to be around him. Nobody's asking you to be abused or beaten on or just let somebody totally trash talk you and downgrade you and disrespect you all the time. But God is requiring us to love people. And it's really not, what God is asking us to do is not that hard, but the one main thing I have to try to get across is love. The kind of love God's asking for is not a feeling. So we, we have to get that through our heads or we're never going to be able to do this. It's not a feeling. Amen? It's a God thing on the inside of you. How many times should I forgive my brother for the same thing? Well, however many times it takes. Love is long-suffering. Let's say it like it should be said. Long-suffering. Amen? I would imagine those first five or six years Dave and I were married that he did a lot of long-suffering. And I can tell you one of the reasons why I'm here today is because Dave showed me this kind of love. And he, um, man, God had the right guy picked out for me. And when I was still married to my first husband that was running around on me all the time and mistreating me, I would lay in bed at night with him and pray that someday God would give me somebody that would really love me. And I always said, make it somebody that'll take me to church. I, like re I, I was born again when I was nine, and I really wanted to serve God, but I just couldn't pull it off without some help. And I just want to say a word about offering yourself to God to disciple other people. When, when people first receive Christ, they need a friend. They need a godly friend that, that will help them. And, not try to run their life and try to always tell them what God's saying they should do, but just somebody that they can ask questions and somebody that can be a, an example to them. And Dave would confront me, but he only did it when he felt like God was telling him to. Where I, on the other hand, confronted everything that moved. If you, like... <laughs> You are not going to treat me that way. If you think I'm going to put up with this, you've got another thing coming. Come on, anybody. Have I got any sisters out there? Well, I hate to tell you this, but that's one of the things that's got to go. Man, I hope you still like me after tonight. You cannot imagine how happy and peaceful you will be when you stop letting everything make you mad. It, it's all pride anyway. Bless God, you are not going to treat me that way. Well, you know, Jesus didn't do that. They just mistreated him, and he just went on about his business, kept his mind on what God had sent him to do. When people accused him of things, boy, we get so defensive when somebody accuses us, I am going to convince you that I am a good person. Let me convince you that you are wrong about me and I'm a good person. Jesus just said, well, whatever you think. You know why? Because he knew who he was. 
And if we really know who we are, and you know what, I know I'm right with God. So you can say whatever you want to about me and I'm not gonna lose any sleep over it. Now I'd rather you like me, but if you don't, it's between you and God. I'm not going to compromise my morals to get you to like me. Amen? You know, you get old enough, you just don't care what people think. And I'm long past that caring what people think. Because there's always going to be somebody thinking something, so whatever. I've been through enough with God, I know where I stand with Him, and I know where I came from, and I know what God's done, and I know where I'm going. Hallelujah. Amen. And Dave would confront me, and I want you to hear this part of this story because you're dealing with some stuff in relationships, this will really help you. He would confront me, and anytime anybody confronts you about bad behavior, it always makes you mad. You never say, oh, thank you. Thank you for telling me that I'm a jerk. Now, the Bible says only a fool hates correction, but I, there's a lot of fools running around out there because only one time in my whole life have I ever met anybody that has thanked me when I've corrected them, and it's Mike Shepard, our staff pastor. And I don't know if he means it or not, but he says it, so. <laughs> but I would start trying to, you know, convince Dave how wrong he was about what he was saying about me. And I always remember he would say, look, I'm just telling you what I believe God told me to tell you. Now it's between you and God. You can do whatever you want to with it. <laughs> See, we make a mistake when we, when we try to convince people. And then the, the other thing he did that was so important is he would never mistreat me after that. He didn't give me the silent treatment. He would just go right on loving me just as if it never happened. And it's amazing what happens when you just leave people with God. <laughs> just, he just said, I said what I believe God told me to say. Now, the rest of it's between you and God. If you want to listen to him, fine. If you don't, that's fine. Oh, and that would make me so mad. Man, because I wanted to have a good argument. I'll tell you, love, real love, the God kind of love has some characteristics that we don't know very much about. There's a lot of prickly people in the world. John Ortberg calls them porcupine people. You know, a porcupine has 30,000 quills. Comes out to protect them. You know, we give away every kind of stuffed animal, but I've never given anybody a stuffed porcupine. <laughs> Somehow they're just not real loving. But you know what? In mating season, even porcupines find a way to get together. Which tells me that if desire is strong enough, <laughs> you'll even put up with a little pain. <laughs> so, <laughs> you see, I really want to do this love thing. <laughs> I mean, I want to do it. And so, God help me. I print it on my foot. I confess it. I read about it. I preach about it. And I am not going to shut up until I can do it. Yeah. Amen. Now, there's a tough love, that's the word they call it, and it really just means, 
You know, you're not helping somebody when you keep doing for them what they should be doing for themselves. So if you got a 40-year-old kid that's still living off of you, well then, you might help them more if you ask them to move. <laughs> and I think the church is all mixed up about love. Well, we just want to show them love. Well, you know, there was a guy in the church that was in incest and he wasn't repentant. Paul put him out of the church. And he said he did it to wake him up. That he couldn't more or less have his cake and eat it too. In other words, if you want to be part of this fellowship, you can't keep living in incest. But no, we don't do that anymore today. Well, we, we just want to show them love. Well, that's not always love. Sometimes you love somebody more if you do confront them, but then continue having a loving attitude toward them. What happens is a lot of times if we confront somebody, then we shut them out of our lives. And that was the thing that Dave never did. I didn't know what love was, and he showed it to me. And a lot of people need to see it. And that's why this message is so important to me. And I thank God that I have an opportunity to speak to so many people and that this message tonight is being seen live all over the world. And then when it goes on our program, it'll be translated into a hundred different languages and go all over the world. Because I'll tell you, this is the answer to the world's problems. And it just makes me so mad when I write a book on love and people don't buy it. <laughs> they told me the other day in the office, well, the pre-sales on this book are half of what the pre-sales were on the last book. And I was just like, people are going to get this? <laughs> I don't care how long I have to preach it. <laughs> They asked Jesus, what is the most important commandment? Come on. Come on. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's it. You say, well, Joyce, what about faith? Well, Galatians 5, 6 says, faith only works and is energized through love. Jesus tells us in Mark 11 that we can ask for anything and God will do it. We can pray prayers that will move mountains. But we need to pay attention to the buts and ifs in the Bible. If you have anything against anyone, <laughs> drop it, leave it, let it go or your prayers won't be answered. So I can just say, I don't care if you intercede five hours every day. If you've got unforgiveness in your heart, you're wasting your breath. Well, I got a few people that like this and a bunch of you can't make your mind up yet. You say, well, Joyce, I'm hurting and I have personal problems and I've got a wounded soul and I, I thought you'd minister to me tonight. <laughs> oh, honey, if you only knew how I am ministering to you. <laughs> Jesus said, one new commandment I give unto you. One, everybody say one. <laughs> Love. Love. Love people the way God loves you. It's so much fun to love people. It is so much fun to love your enemies because they just don't get it. 
They just, it's like, are you nuts? They just don't get it. But that's the thing that'll melt hard, cold hearts. Let's just say that you have a waiter or a waitress that's waiting on you and they're being extremely rude. You say, Josh, should I just put up with it? Well, no, I think sometimes for the other person's benefit, you need to say something, but it's the way you say it and the attitude in which you say it that's important. So you might say something like, you know, I realize you're probably having a really hard day and maybe you got some hard things going on in your life, but you know, please don't take it out on me, and uh, I'll pray for you. They'll get the point, and then pray for them. I'm not asking you to be a doormat and let everybody walk all over you, but sometimes you might have to stand back and let it seem like people are taking advantage of you for a while. We need to learn to move when God moves. We, it, it needs to be like it was in the Old Testament. When the cloud moved, they moved, and when the cloud parked, they parked. Amen? I don't know about you, but I don't have to have a dessert message. When I, when I go, I want to hear something that's going to make me change. I, Well, how does God tell us to treat our enemies? Well, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I'm telling you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. So, there's really only three simple things that God tells us to do to fulfill the requirements of love. Pray for people that hurt you. Bless and do not curse them, and that means to speak well of them and not evil. So when somebody does hurt you, that means you need to pray for them and you don't get to talk bad about them. That means you don't get to tell somebody else what they did. And boy, isn't it hard when somebody's hurt you and you know bad stuff about them, and you hear other people just say, oh, they're just such a great guy. They're just so, man, it's so hard to keep your mouth shut. You just want to say, yeah, well, let me tell you a few things. <laughs> and then the Bible tells us if our enemy's hungry, feed him, and if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. So, for me, it's come down to a real simple formula. You hurt me, and the first thing I'm going to do is pray. The second thing I'm going to do is make a commitment not to talk about you. And the third thing I'm going to do is tell God, if you need any help and He wants me to help you, please let me know. I know this, maybe we're standing at a new gate tonight. That's okay. I was on TBN advertising this book, and I'll tell you, Matt and Laurie and I had such a good time. Because Matt admitted right on TV, he said, I, got a, I have a problem with this. Well, you know what? We all have a problem with this. And it's, that's why it has to be something that is prayed over especially and studied and You need to remind yourself. You need to talk to yourself. It's just not, it's a challenging thing to do. But I believe it's the only thing that's going to change this sick, sad world that we're living in. And, you know, there's enough of us who at least claim to be Christians if we would get out in the world and act like one and really start just loving people with the love of God, with this agape, I honestly believe, and I, maybe you think I'm nuts, but I honestly believe that we could change the world. You know, Jesus turned the world upside down with this message. Amen.
Luke 6, 27 through 29. Really hard scriptures to swallow. But I say to you who are listening now to me in order to heed and make it a practice to love your enemies, treat well, do good to, act nobly toward those who detest you and pursue you with hatred. My. Invoke blessings upon and pray for the happiness of those who curse you. Well, I told God I don't want them to be happy. <laughs> but see, here's the thing that he showed me. In order for somebody who's mistreated you to be happy, they have to come to a place of repentance. They have to deal with that with God. So when somebody's hurt you and you pray for them to be happy, what you're asking God to do is reveal to the truth to them about the way they are so they can repent. When you ask God to bless your enemies, you're not asking him to give them a new house and a new car. You're really asking him to give them some truth, to help them see the truth because of what they're doing to themselves. Listen, I lived a life where I was full of hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness, and I was miserable. There was no way I could be happy. I don't care what I owned, I could not be happy until I got that poison out of me. Amen? And when you forgive somebody, you are, you're helping yourself a whole lot more than you're helping them. And I just wonder, standing here looking at you tonight, who you're mad at. <laughs> I can honestly stand here and say that right now at this moment, I'm not mad at anybody. I don't have anything against anybody. And I pray God. And anytime something sneaks in there that he'll reveal it to me so I can get it out and deal with it. Because if I don't ever do anything else from now until I die, I want to learn how to love people the way God wants me to love people. Amen. We don't need to try to be famous. We don't need to try to be rich. We, you know, we, we just need to learn how to love each other. Just love each other. And you don't have to be like me for me to love you, and I don't have to be like you, and you don't have to be perfect. You can make mistakes, and the Bible says to bear with the failings of the weak. Because we all have to put up with our own little oppressive load of faults. Who do we think we are to shut somebody out of our life because they've got a couple of quirky things in their personality? We're all quirky. Amen? Everybody seems normal till you really get to know them. <laughs> then you find out you're a little weird. <clears throat> you know, what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. We got to stop this. Well, I love her, but that is, that is, I never realized how silly that is. We say that all the time. Well, I love her, but this just really irritates me so bad. That's not what love is. <laughs> love says, I love you enough that I'll put up with that if I have to, because I know I'm not perfect either. Amen. Let's just say your neighbor has been really hard to deal with. Now you find out that he's got cancer, stage four, and probably won't make it. Well, if you're really trying to do what God wants you to, you won't say, well, you reap what you sow. Serves him right. No, what you're going to do is go mow his grass shovel this snow, and you're going to think, I've got an opportunity now. This guy's down and out. And I'm going to love him into the kingdom before he dies. Amen? You offer to take him to his doctor's appointment. You offer to go to the grocery store for him. 
And he's not stupid. He knows he's been a jerk. And he's, he's going to know that there's something really strange about you. If you're offering to do all these things, well, why should I do that? Well, why should Jesus do what he did for us? Can anybody in here think of any good reason why Jesus should have died for you? I can't think of any good reason why he should have done it for me, but he did. Well, I didn't care anything about him at all. You just don't know how tickled I am to preach this tonight. Your boss has passed you over for a promotion that you well deserved. You really felt you should have had. And man, you are having a hard time getting over it. I understand that. Some things are harder to get over than others. I mean, you're just really having a hard time letting it go. I mean, you've prayed about it. You've asked other people to pray for you. And you just still just like, you're just full of all these bad, nasty, hateful feelings. Well, now this is just something I've found and I believe it's biblical. And you do what you want to. But for me, I have discovered that when I'm caught in a trap like that, if I will do something nice for them, send them a gift, whatever, it, it breaks that power. Love overcomes evil. Amen? And you can do it anonymously. It's like this mysterious, magical power that works. I, I tell pastors, if you've got somebody in your church and you've been good to them and you, they, they came, when they came to your church, they were just a mess and you've helped them and prayed with them and loved them into wholeness and now they take about half your congregation and go two miles down the road and start their own church. You know, if you're smart, what you'll do, buy them a sound system. Now that went over big. Come on now, this is 40 years. Help me a little bit. And, and of course, the first, well, why should I do that? Well, because you're like Jesus. Supposedly. Amen. I don't know. I feel like I know this secret. If I can just get people to understand this. And I know you've heard my story, but I can't preach this message without giving you the quick version of the thing with my mom and dad. My dad sexually abused me. Started with molestation when I got old enough, literally turned me into his mistress. He didn't force me physically, but he forced me with fear. And there's so many terrible things and a couple things really that I've never even told anybody. They just would be hard for me to even say. And my mom knew what he was doing to me. She caught him, I told her, and she didn't have the courage to deal with it. And so naturally, I just wanted to get away from them and stay away from them. And I did the thing, you know, I'd send them a little something on Christmas or I'd go to the house for 45 minutes and make some excuse to get out of there and a little birthday gift. And they lived about 300 miles away from St. Louis. And I was just glad. Well, as they got older and weren't able to take care of themselves, and there weren't any real good doctors in the area where they were at, and they didn't have any money, and I was praying one morning, you got to be careful when you pray, because <laughs> God is liable to tell you to do something you don't want to do. Yeah. And I, all of a sudden, it came to my heart that 
I should move them to St. Louis and buy them a house. I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I said, that is the devil. <laughs> Buy them a house and take care of them until they die. You know, the first thing that, that I, well, first I didn't think it was God, but then it kept coming back to me and coming back and coming back. And you know that stuff that just won't go away? You might as well just go ahead and do what God wants because he is not going to shut up until you do. And man, I didn't want to do that. Whoa, I did not want to do that. I didn't want to give them, it was going to take money to buy a house, Dave, and I didn't have that much money. And so, one of the first things I said is, why should I do that? They never did anything for me. And you know, God didn't cut me any slack. He said, you're breathing, aren't you? They fed you, they sent you to school, they put clothes on your back and a roof over your head. Whew. Well, you know, God wants us to find something good about somebody, no matter how much bad there is. And the Bible tells us if we don't take care of our relatives, we're worse than an unbeliever. And He doesn't say do it if they're nice or if they've been good to you, He just says do it. Oh, you. So I thought, well, I'm going to go ask Dave, and he's going to tell me there's no way he's going to spend the little money we got buying them a house. And Dave said, well, if God told you to do it, you better do it. <laughs> well, thank you. Long story short, we bought him a house, we bought him a car. We paid somebody to cut their grass. We made sure they had groceries every week. You, you know, all the stuff it takes to live. And of course, they just, we got longevity in my bloodline. <laughs> and I kept thinking, this has got to be over soon. And nope, they make it another year. And, well, I'm just telling you the truth. And uh, so, three years, my father was still just as mean as a snake, and no thank you, no nothing. And then one morning, my mother called and said, your dad's been crying for a week, and he wants to know if you'll come over. So I went over, and now he's 80 years old, 80, and he apologized to me, finally. 80. And I asked him, I said, Daddy, would you like to be saved? He says, and so we prayed with him, prayed the prayer of salvation with him, and he asked us if we would baptize him. And, and I, don't, I hope this doesn't come across sounding wrong, but I thought I was buying a house, but I bought a soul. Amen? And here's what I want you to understand. I didn't even realize what an effect that was going to have on me and what I was going to learn out of that. But I know that what I'm trying to tell you tonight is real. And my father hurt me because he'd been hurt. He had a lot of really warped ideas about sex, and I think he put those ideas off on my mother, and there was just a lot of weirdness in my family. And I felt like I ended up taking care of all of them, my brother, my mother, my father, and my widowed aunt. And at one time, we were paying for my mom, my dad, and my aunt all to be in nursing home care. And it, I mean, it was expensive. <clears throat> for a while, they lived in their house, and then when they got too old, 
we, <clears throat> we put them in an assisted living apartment, and then they went from there to the nursing home. And what I'm going to tell you is the absolute truth. For years, I went every other week to that nursing home and visited them. Now listen to me, there was not one time that I went that I wanted to go. Not one. But I knew it was the right thing to do. Now, somebody please get what I'm trying to say. We got to come up higher and we got to do what's right because it's right. Not because we want to or it feels good. This agape kind of love, you don't necessarily have the warm and fuzzies. But you see, it pleases me to know <clears throat> that my father is in heaven looking down tonight saying, go get them, girl. Yeah. Amen. So that's that story. And I know from that that this same thing works with everybody. Now, Romans 12, 20 says, but if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For if you do this, you'll heap burning coals upon his head. And we think, yeah, I like those burning coals. <laughs> Pour it on God. Well, wait a minute. Let me tell you what those are. Footnote in the Amplified Bible under Proverbs 25, 21. It says, this is not to be understood as a revengeful act intended to embarrass your enemy, but just the opposite. <clears throat> it gives the picture of the high priest who on the day of atonement took a censer and filled it with burning coals of fire and put, the hot co put it on the hot coals and this incense produced a sweet smell. Every time we walk in love, it's like this sweet smell goes up before God. And the cloud of smoke from the incense covered the mercy seat and became acceptable to God for atonement. So yeah, when you, when, when you love somebody that doesn't deserve it, it's like heaping burning coals of fire on their head. But you know what those burning coals do? They melt those hard, nasty, mean hearts. Come on. All right, Colossians 3. <clears throat> Clothe yourselves as God's own chosen ones, His own picked representatives, who are purified and holy and well-beloved by God Himself, by putting on behavior. <laughs> You ever think of that? We put on behavior. You can put off behavior, you can put on behavior. Marked by tender-hearted pity, mercy, kind feelings, a lowly opinion of yourselves, gentle ways, and patience, which is tireless and long-suffering, has the power to endure whatever comes with good temper. Verse 14 says, and above all that you put on, put on love. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm getting dressed in the morning, if I put on something, I go and look at myself in the mirror. Some people, I look at them and I think, surely you did not look in the mirror before you left today. <laughs> I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Always look at yourself in the mirror before you leave. And. If you look at yourself and it don't look right, you'll take it off and try something else. Penny told me tonight she put on four different things. Well, I put this on, and then I put on something else, and I put on something else, and I put this back on. And so there are, there are clothes that look good on us and clothes that don't. And we are clothed spiritually as well as physically, see? And 
in the spirit world, God and the devil see our spiritual clothes. And in Revelation 16, 15, and 17, it says, Behold, I'm going to come like a thief. It's Jesus saying, I'm going to come quickly. Sneak up, and you're not going to be expecting me. Blessed, happy, and to be envied is he who stays awake and guards his clothes. So that he may not be naked and have the shame of being seen exposed. Now that doesn't mean to sit in your closet with a shotgun <laughs> and guard your clothes. He's talking about be careful about the kind of behavior that you have because that's all the world can see is how we behave. And I'll just tell you right now, do not put a bumper sticker on your car if you're not going to behave like a Christian. Don't do it. I am tired of people disrespecting the church and disrespecting Christians, but in a way I understand why they feel about us the way that they do, because there's so many phonies. Amen? And I'm not playing games. I'm either going to do this right or not do it. Amen? So, I had them make me these things, and you know, there's certain things that just don't look good on us. I'm going to try this one on and see what I think. Ooh. Anger. Yeah. No, that don't look good on me. I have to try something else here. Let's see. Um. Oh, how about this one? I don't think this color looks good on me, but maybe I could get by with it. We'll see. Let's see. Ooh, envy. Well, that don't look very good on me either, does it? No. I'll hang them up later. Oh, how about this one? Woohoo! Wow. By the way, that's going to be my next book. I'm going to write it. What about me? All right. Well, we're going to get on this one tomorrow afternoon. That don't look good either. Man, do I have anything in this closet that's going to look right? Let's try this one. Tried everything else. See if this one works. Ah, finally, something that looks right. Now I'm ready to go for the day. Amen. And what you got to do is you got to take time in the morning. You know what? If we took half of the time getting dressed spiritually, I don't know about you, but I don't look like this when I get up. <laughs> I mean, I've already got a plan. I'll get up at 6 in the morning. I'll pray, spend some time with God, study a little bit. I got somebody coming to fix my hair. I got somebody coming to do my makeup. I got my outfit picked out. And it'll take me a couple hours to 
get this in order to show up over here looking right. Well, you know what I figured out? It takes me longer than that to get dressed spiritually and to look right. Now, it's getting easier all the time, but man, in the beginning, whoo, it was hard. Are you understanding me? All right. <clears throat> now, talk to yourself before you go out every day. Have a meeting with yourself and talk to yourself and tell yourself, now, with God's help today, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to behave right. I'm going to put on behavior that's right. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 to put on righteousness. Put on peace. Put on the helmet of salvation. Think like a Christian. Amen? Lift up the shield of faith. Wield the two-edged sword of the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't think that clock's doing what it's supposed to. It's telling me what time it is, and I need to know how long I've been preaching. Because I'm just liable to go a long time if nobody tells me. You guys have always got my clock right. What? What? Okay, I'll just preach till I'm done then. Um, I don't know. Maybe God doesn't want us preaching by the clock anyway. Just, that's part of our problem. Okay. We've worshiped 12 and a half minutes. Now we've got to go on to something else. Who cares if there's a move of God? It's time to move on. Amen. <laughs> I know you guys, man, Chris Tomlin is going to make you so happy when I'm done beating up on you. <laughs> Love is the most important thing in the world. Now abides faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Will anybody make a commitment to buy everything you can get your hands on about love, to find every scripture you can in the Bible about love, read every book you can get your hands on about love, pray about love? Ask the Holy Spirit to annoy you no end until you learn how to love people the way God does. Amen? And go out prepared. I'll tell you one little quick story, and they finally told me what time it is, so. And I'm doing good. I got 51 seconds left. I can say a lot <laughs> that length of time. My daughter went to the grocery store not too long ago, and she was at the checkout. She was checking out, and she realized that she left her purse in the car, and her credit card was in her purse. And so she said, I'm, I'm going to have to run to the car. I'll be right back. And quick, the cashier whipped her own credit card out of her pocket and said, no, I'll take care of this. Now, my daughter also many times has paid for other people's groceries when they've looked like they needed help or they came up short. But the thing that I loved about that story is that girl had that card in her pocket. She went to work that day prepared. Right. See, I love that. And that's what we need to do. We need to go prepared. We need to go out of our house looking for people. While you're at this conference, don't just hang out with your two buddies. Look for somebody by themselves. You think it'd be easy to come to something like this by yourself? And there's so many people that did. I saw people last night walking by themselves, going back to their hotels. I respect that. 
you're hungry for more of God. And if you couldn't find somebody to come with you, you're coming anyway. Amen? Let's get prepared ahead of time. Will you, will you spend at least five minutes in the morning getting dressed spiritually? And start praying about this thing. God, I want to walk in love. Oh, I got, man, I've still got so far to go. Every time I preach on this, I realize I'm still in kindergarten. And I've got so far to go. But I hope and pray that you'll remember that love is not just a feeling. It can produce feelings, but it's not just a feeling. And you don't have to feel right to do what's right. Amen? And the people that need to be loved the most, that are desperate for love, normally act in a way that makes it hard to love them. Amen? I'm going to pray. Father, I know if I said right now, everybody who's going to commit to walking in more love, stand up, everybody get up, so I'm not even going to bother doing it. But I pray that by your grace and mercy that people heard me, not just with ears on their head, but the ones in their spirit. And that they'll understand there's nothing more important than learning how to walk in love with everybody, not just the people we like. And I thank you, Lord, for changing us. I thank you for the people that love me, and the people that love me unconditionally. And I just want us all to walk in love. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a praise.